Well, good morning, folks. Here we are again. I say that almost every time, but here we are. We're looking in the book of Hebrews, and we're up to chapter 3 now. We're going to have a walk through it, or a run through it, perhaps. And I hope you're getting something out of these things. Some difficult uh, portions of Scripture, hard to understand sometimes, but when we compare Scripture with Scripture, it's not so difficult. Make sure you have a pen and paper with you to write down uh, references and things for you to look up. Um, I don't know anybody that has that good of a memory that can remember everything that's said and all the references and stuff. And if you're anything like me, you'll forget what you did early in the morning anyway, so you need to write things down. So do that, it's good for you. Well, uh, hello to those on uh, Christian Coffee Time. Uh, just thank you for coming in and having a listen to these things. I hope it helps you. Uh, let's have a word of prayer quickly and then we will get going. Our Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for your grace upon us. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for your work at the cross and your resurrection from the dead and interceding for the saints right now at the right hand of the Father. Help us, Lord, as we go through this chapter, chapter 3 of Hebrews. In your word, Lord, it's so precious. Help us to understand, help us to see the interpretations and make the applications to our hearts and lives. All to your honor and glory. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, let's get going and back up a little bit, an uh, introduction uh, into this chapter and some of the things that have gone on before uh, have to be um, noted because you'll notice the first word there in Hebrews chapter 3 is wherefore. The first word in chapter 2 was therefore, simply meaning that because of what's already been said, here's the action that needs to take place, okay? So... We see what's taking place here uh, is not a lot different from what was in the last chapter uh, where, and previous to that, um, where Jesus and angels are compared. And here he's going to compare Moses with Jesus. Now the theme of the book, is that the right word to use, the theme, I'm not sure, uh, the overall what's going on in the book is uh, the Holy Spirit is trying to convince um, some amongst this group of Hebrews, somewhere in Italy we believe it is, probably Rome, that some had a heart of unbelief. They had tasted the good word of God, they'd seen uh, um, tremendous things, but they hadn't entered in through belief yet. And you understand that illumination, enlightenment, knowledge that the Spirit of God gives is not salvation. People are saved through believing in Jesus Christ not having the knowledge of, and, and, but the Spirit of God uses that enlightenment to show them this is what you must do, this is where you must go. So he's trying to draw them. Uh, this is not the loss of salvation, as so many people say it's in the religion. No, it isn't. You're not saved by illumination. Maybe that's the problem today in our evangelism, that many people are um, just to that state, and they're told, okay, just, you're good to go now, kind of thing. No. Sometimes it may take a while as the Spirit of God draws that person to that place of complete and absolute belief in Jesus Christ. That's above all else, putting everything else aside, your whole self, your whole heart to Christ. Okay? It's not the loss of salvation. Again, enlightenment does not save. And you'll notice as we go through this <coughs> chapter, excuse me, <coughs> um, three times the Spirit of God references something from the Old Testament, which is called the provocation in the wilderness in Numbers chapter uh, 13 and 14, where the children of Israel, who were brought out of Egypt, come up to the edge of the Promised Land, and the Lord says, send spies in and search it out. And they were in there for a long time, and they come back, and they brought back uh, um, some of the fruits and stuff from the land. And they give the report, and the people saw the fruits, they tasted it, they saw, they, they heard some tremendous things, but yet they were afraid of the giants that were in the land. They said that we are as grasshoppers to them. He says, what are we going to do? We're going to all perish. Why did we come here anyways? Let's find somebody who will take us back to Egypt. So they had seen the things of the promised land, of God's promised rest, and so on and so forth. They had tasted of it, and yet through unbelief they said, no, nope, we don't want it, we're going back. Okay? So God was very upset with them, as we'll see through this. And, and here we see 
the Spirit of God uses those things in the Old Testament as, I call them pictures. There are things to help us to see and understand. It talks about that in uh, Romans, is it chapter 14? I think it is. And in Corinthians once that the things that were written beforehand were written for our learning. There are pictures and such. Okay, we'll get into that another time. Let's have a look here. First of all, wherefore? Okay, because of these things that we see here, he says, wherefore, holy brethren. Now, we just stop and think about that word holy. If you uh, confess and profess Christ as your Savior, your life should be uh, one of holiness. And God says, be holy for I am holy. That means you've got to let go of the old ways. The Spirit of God uh, uh, does that work in your heart. You don't want the old ways. You were changed when you got saved. Your heart's different. Your heart is towards God and the things of God, not towards sin and such like that. If it is, you've got a big problem. But holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling. Now, brethren is probably a Jewish writer here. Uh, it's not Paul. It's not Timothy. The Bible says that. Um, but it doesn't really matter because the writers of the uh, scriptures were basically just instruments in the Lord's hand, in the Spirit of God's hand, like that pen would be an instrument in my hand to do the writing. The pen didn't write the letter. I did. The pen was just an instrument. If we could say it that way, it's a crude way to put it, but it's kind of like that. The Spirit of God gave us the uh, scriptures. Holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, the gospel call. When somebody came to you and presented the gospel to you somewhere along the line, uh, maybe many times, that's God calling you. And when you go out and witness to somebody, take a track and uh, tell them about Jesus, you are calling them. Rather, God is calling them through you, isn't he? He says, consider. Now, <clears throat> look at that word, consider. That. We look at, I like studying the words. I go back and look at um, um, uh, uh, Greek uh, uh, New Testament and then take that word and find out what it means, okay? Which is very important for us because we're going to find out what the meaning of the word is, the word that the Holy Spirit gave us. It's one thing to look it up in our English uh, uh, language dictionaries, but it may not be exactly the same as was given in the Greek language. You know what I mean? Uh, definitions may be different. But this word right here, our profession, means to declare, to declare something openly to declare something publicly. Now, I was thinking about this the other day, and uh, you know, over in Revelation uh, chapter two and three, you have the seven letters to the seven churches. In the first church, Ephesus, he says, they've got all these wonderful works and things that they do. He says, but I have somewhat against you. You've left your first love. And I've wondered about that. Okay, the love for Christ had diminished. How does it show itself, or how would it show itself in its diminishing? And my mind went back to first getting saved and telling people about Christ. You just tell everybody all the time, everywhere. My younger brother got saved. You stop people on the street and say, did you hear the good news about Jesus Christ? I think that's what happened to the book of uh, the church in Ephesus. They had all kinds of works, did things, but they stopped telling people about Jesus. Well, that's a whole other subject. We're on a rabbit trail right now. But you just stop and think about it. You see, you've got to take the Word of God and apply it to your heart and life. Even the definitions of words have great uh, applications for us. First love is to tell others about Jesus Christ. Spiritual tune-up may be required there. Verse 2, uh, uh, the high apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him that appointed him, that is the Father, as also Moses was faithful in all his house. It doesn't mean his house like where you live. It has the idea, or metaphorically speaking, of Israel as God's house, you see. And then it's going to talk about Jesus in his house, speaking of this age we are in now, this church age, the believers brought into, he's building a temple. Ah, there you go, we're the, part of the house of Christ. Okay, so that's what that's referring to. As Moses was faithful in all his house, in his work for the Lord, it was faithful in all that God gave to him, gave him to do. For this man, uh, Jesus that is, was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, of course, because this is the Lord God himself 
God manifests in the flesh, there's Jesus Christ on the earth, more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he has built the house. He's responsible for the, uh, the living stones, the lively stones that we are that make up this temple. And we individuals are, uh, know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Inasmuch as he that has built the house, as believers, has more honor than the house. You need to stop there for a minute when we think about that. Sometimes people look um, more to the house, to the religion, to the things of what they do on a weekly basis, or there's church services, or their church, or whatever, maybe more than Jesus. Maybe, maybe look into those things more than they do Jesus. Again, getting back to that Ephesus, uh, Revelation chapter 2, uh, um, I think it's verse 4, Thou hast left thy first love. It keeps coming up, keeps popping up. For, verse 4, For every house is built by some man, but he that built all things is God. And Moses was faithful in all his house as a servant. Now that word servant right there isn't just like we would think of a servant in our language today. Uh, back then the word meant, uh, it was the word theraton, it meant to serve as an attendant. Um, it had the idea of, of someone healing. So Moses was bringing the word of God and the things of God to them for the healing of the people, the healing of the nation and such. That's the idea of that servant. That word uh, that this comes from in the Greek language is where we get our English word therapist or therapy. Okay? And the one who brings that to that comfort and that healing to the individual. For a testimony of those things which were spoken after, <clears throat> but Christ as a son. Moses the servant, Christ the son over his own house as he made all things. Now he says, um, whose house are we if we hold fast the confidence of a rejoicing and of the hope firm unto the end. So some say, well, you see, there you're going to lose it. If you don't hold fast, then you've lost it. Well, you've got to remember that he's talking about ones who are enlightened, ones who have, were illuminated, had tasted, okay? We're going to see that, uh, we saw that word, uh, word tasted back in chapter 2. And if you should listen to these things in order, the chapters, uh, it was just like a test drive. They had tasted, they weren't, they aren't saved. He says you're in danger of going back and the danger is apostasy which will reject Christ, reject God, reject the word of God and turn away and he says, look it, after you seeing and hearing and tasting and knowing these things and you willfully reject, there is no more sacrifice for sin. They're damned, they're done, the door will be shut. And we see a, a glimpse into the heart of God as he's trying to convince those ones, don't go back, come on, come ahead, come in through the door of salvation, come in through faith and belief. If we hold fast, he's showing that, um, that uh, he's talking about true faith continues. It holds steadfast unto the end. And you could say that uh, um, the proof is in the pudding in that um, salvation is seen by the person. We'll still keep going on. There's no going back. The true believer, true biblical believing faith in Jesus Christ goes on through whatever. You stop and think about way back in the first century when Nero was the emperor and they would get Christians and bring them into that Colosseum in Rome there and do all kinds of terrible things to them and, and uh, set wild beasts on them, lions and everything else. Those people stand there, they would just take it, look up to the Lord. How many of them were put to this, uh, uh, chained to a stake and wood and tinders put around them and set on fire? They don't renounce Christ. You see, the, the enemies were trying to get them to renounce Christ. They wouldn't renounce Christ. They're not going to go back. They're going to continue on with him. Where these ones that hadn't really entered in would stop and they would give it up. They'd say, no, I'm not going there. It's too tough. Let me go back to where I was. Let's go back to Egypt. That's the apostate. Verse 7, wherefore, as the Holy Ghost. See that word, Holy Ghost? I don't like to use that word ghost. It's the Holy Spirit. Today, the word ghost has a connotation of something evil and sinister, okay? Um, words change, you know. 
There's the Holy Spirit. But whatever, that's just me. But the Holy Spirit says today, this present day of grace, he's talking about, this is a reference from the uh, Psalms, of course. Uh, he says, today if you will hear his voice. Today, the Bible says, is the day of salvation. This moment, this time right now. You don't know if you got tomorrow. You don't know if you'll see the end of today. Better get things right. Better get things right with God. Can repent of your sins. Trust in Jesus Christ and you'll be saved and heaven will be your home. It's going to be from your heart. Not just some, you know some things in your head about Jesus. That won't get you anywhere. That'll get you into hell. That's, that's all. I'm sorry. Salvation is from the heart. Romans chapter 10 verses 9 and 10. Read it. Check it out. Wherefore, as the Holy Spirit said, today if you will hear his voice. Now listen to this. He says, will you hear my voice? And look at that, verse 8. Harden not your hearts. The Spirit of God saying, don't harden your heart. What hardens a person's heart? Neglect of things. Neglect of the things of God. And even for Christians, we can take this as uh, uh, an attitude check, uh, um, so, so to speak, to, to look at an application to ourselves. He says, don't neglect the things of God. And also he talks about sin hardens. You think you can fool around with sin? You think you can come close to it and you can sip from that cup? You cannot. It will harden your heart towards the things of God. The Christian cannot lose his salvation. God says so. John 3.16, he gives everlasting life. It's not temporary life, it's everlasting. God decrees that Christ has paid it all and you trust in him. You're going to be in heaven. You're predestined at that time. You are predestined to be in heaven, conformed to the image of his son. Predestination doesn't talk about it. It doesn't mean to be saved. It means that God has promised and he has decreed that this is what will happen with you. You're going to be there. When you believe in Christ, you're going to be with him. Harden not your hearts as in the provocation. Okay, there's that we talked about earlier. In the temptation in the wilderness... Numbers chapter 13 and 14. Um, I'm just trying to figure out my time here because my camera kicks off at about 22 minutes. I think I have five minutes before I have to go reset it. I just think it's still going. I hope it is. Um, the, the day of temptation in the wilderness when your fathers tempted me. Now, I think the, the children of Israel, here this is what God's estimation of what happened back then. He says, they tempted me. It means to test. They put God to the test? Wow. You put God to the test? No, we don't put God to the test. He puts us to the test. We don't test God. And proved me. They tested him to see what, if he was worthy kind of thing. This is an absolute insult to God, what they did back then. He said, they saw my works, and they saw my works 40 years. That was the result of it. Wherefore, I was grieved. Now, that's not grieved as if you were at a funeral or something like that. This grieved right here means to be angry, displeased, or disgusted with. God was insulted and disgusted with that generation. And he said these two things about them. This is what they always do. These two things. Um, verse 10. One, they, they always err in their heart. See, here's the heart of the matter of the book of Hebrews. It's a heart matter. Some had not believed with their heart yet. They had seen and heard. They see the way. They see their sin. Everything else. So this is where the problem is. Words are easy. Belief must be from the heart. How's your heart before the Lord? How is it? Have you left your first love? Secondly, and they have not known my ways. They got a heart problem and they've not known my ways. That word known right there has the idea of knowing by experience. Okay? So we're up to verse 11. So we see there he's referenced this provocation in the wilderness. He does it three times through this. It's pretty important stuff. If you want to understand what the book of Hebrews is about, and apostasy and this illumination and all these difficult things, especially when you get up to chapter 6 and chapter 10, 
Go back to the Old Testament, read Numbers chapter 13 and 14 and see that provocation in the wilderness, what they did. How that God said, <clears throat> you're not going in because of your unbelief. <coughs> Excuse me, just a minute. <clears throat> Verse 11, so I swear in my wrath, God was not pleased. His wrath was against them. So in verse 10, we see the errors. They had a heart problem. They had not known his ways. Verse 11, we see the consequences. Through unbelief, they'll give up and go away. It says, they shall not enter into my rest. The promised land was called God's rest. Today, salvation is the rest of God. God's rest for the believer, you see. Even though they saw, they tasted of the land, through unbelief they wanted to go back to Egypt, saying, no, we don't want the Lord, we don't want those things, we're not going into the promised land, then the door of the promised land is shut closed to them through their unbelief. Verse 12, he says, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart. That word evil there has the idea of evil that causes pain and sorrow. An evil heart of unbelief in departing. There's where we get our word apostasy from, is that word right there. Uh, we also talked earlier about this departing, this apostasy. That some they go ahead and such, then go back. If you look up 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 22, in and around there, read it, the verses before and after, you'll see that he's talking about the very same thing. They had known the way of righteousness, but they gave up and went away. As the sow that was washed has returned to her wallowing in the mire, and the dog has returned to his vomit. That's a picture in the Bible of apostasy. Coming right up to the door, seeing, tasting, hearing, understanding, but yet, going back, wow. So we see this uh, terrible, terrible thing, verse 12. This, uh, uh, this is the overview of the letter, verse 12, right there. But there is, there is a, 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 a remedy. There is a, a, um, a preventative. And it's here in verse 13. He says, but exhort one another daily. Now, I'm wondering about this. So there's some that weren't quite saved. They under, not quite saved. Either you're saved or you're not. It's like, yeah. um, could it be that in our midst and round about us that there are people that are not quite entered in yet, maybe? Well, we have to just leave that. Because we can't really judge people's hearts. God knows them that are His. But we take the application for ourselves. Look what He says. People around about us, and we're talking about church people, believers and such, are hurting. People need help. Look what he says here, but exhort one another. That means to urge someone to take a particular path. I want you to, for the future. This is what you have to do. I'm encouraging you. Strongly tell, tell me to do this. One another. And he says daily. It's not just like Sunday service, Sunday morning or whatever, Sunday evening or whatever. Is it every day? You get on your phone, you text somebody, you call somebody, you visit somebody, and you encourage them. You help them, because when we're left by ourselves, um, we can have problems, and we get problems mount up. We need people around us. Christians are a body to help, to, to, um, to encourage one another, to exhort, to challenge. While it is called today, Look at what he says. Exhort one another daily, often, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Sin leads you away. Now, the interpretation is to those people who weren't saved. They were illuminated. They saw and they understood the way of salvation. But they're in danger of giving up. The application for ourselves today, believers who have trusted in Jesus Christ, sin still can affect you. What it does is it leads you away from God because it is deceitful. You can't fiddle around with it. You can't have the Savior and sin. When you got saved, that was clear, wasn't it? You can't go back and be careful of the things you watch on television. There's wicked, 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 immoral stuff on there all the time. Occult stuff all the time. B 
be careful. You dabble in that, you sip from that cup. Next time it's easier and easier. Sin will harden your heart towards the things of God. And you'll have, he'll deal, deal with that. Have to deal with you. Verse 14, for we are made partakers of Christ. That means to share with, a partner with, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. The same as back at uh, um, verse 6. If we hold the beginning. How do you begin? You begin by faith from your heart. Faith in Jesus Christ. He's the Savior. He's the Son of God. He's God manifest in the flesh. He went to the cross of Calvary for my sins, for your sins. If we would believe in Him, trust in Him, put our faith in Him with all of our heart, we'd be saved. In His, the person of Christ, the work of the cross, the death, burial, resurrection of Christ, you will be saved. The beginning of our confidence, steadfast unto the end. Start by faith and you will continue by faith. Perseverance, or rather you could say continuance, is a proof of salvation. God says so right there. Verse 15, while it is said today, if you will hear his voice, he says it again, harden not your hearts. Now there's basically three times he said that. What if he says it once? That's pretty important. Three times in a little wee chapter here. Three times. Harden not your hearts. The individual hardens. It's not somebody else's fault. It's not God's fault. It's not somebody else's fault. It's the individual. The things that we let in through the eye gate, through the ear gate. Things you think on. Things you do. Attitudes can harden the heart towards God. You go over again. You go over to uh, the letters to, uh, in the book of Revelation. Uh, chapters 2 and 3. Ephesus did all kinds of wonderful things, and yet they left their first love. Their heart was beginning to get hardened. And you notice out of those five let or seven letters, five of the churches are told to repent of something. Isn't that amazing, eh? Um, so where are we? Verse uh, 15, well, it is said today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation. Hold fast. So we're looking at the thing that's going on here, what he's saying. It's, it's belief versus unbelief. Okay? The heart versus head knowledge. Verse 16, for someone they had heard <clears throat> did provoke. Now he's talking about back in the um, provocation in the wilderness, who was being provoked? Was it God that was being provoked? Well, if we look at the word right here and look at the context, what took place was when the spies came back and you had... You had probably a couple million people there, you know. You had like, I think it said, was it 200,000 men came out? And if every man had a wife and they had a couple of kids and so on and so forth. You got a lot of people, okay? A lot of people there of Israel. And you have 12 spies. And some of them start to complain and grumble. And the word provoked there, it has the idea of to make bitter, to pick, to make bitter. And so they start complaining and grumbling. And pretty soon it starts spreading through the crowd and spreads through. Whoa, wait a minute, there's a great application. Are, are, are any of us ever prone to or find ourselves in a state where we're grumbling about something? We're murmuring about something or somebody else or whatever? You know, that thing can provoke somebody else, can move over to somebody. And the Bible tells, I think it's Hebrew, it says, it talks about a, uh, um, this uh, spirit of bitterness that can rise up, and whereby, whereby many are uh, defiled. You can be careful of that, that thing will spread. Just like laughter is contagious, so is the opposite. So is that grumbling, miserableness, it's contagious. And it comes under the heading of that word right there, provoking, picking, finding fault, that bitterness of heart, okay? For some, when they had heard, did provoke, howbeit not all that came out of Egypt, they weren't all guilty of it. Some wanted to go ahead and go into the land. But with whom was he grieved? It wasn't all the people. It was those ones that complained, those ones that wanted to go back, those ones that didn't believe God's word, those that didn't believe God. He was angry with them, displeased with them. Verse uh, uh, 17, whom he was grieved 40 years. 
He says, you know what? Everybody from 20 years old and under, they're not going to come under that condemnation back then. And a couple of the spies, it was Caleb and, and it was Joshua, and probably a few others. But there's a multitude of them that um, didn't want to go ahead. They had sinned and they wandered in the wilderness 40 years until they would die off. When they were all, all the grumblers and complainers were died off, 40 years later, Joshua leads the children of Israel in. Okay. Hey, it's another picture. Moses leads them right up to the promised land, but he can't take them into the rest. Moses dies. Joshua takes them in. It's a picture. Moses represents the Ten Commandments, the law. That doesn't bring you into the rest. It takes Joshua, Jehoshua, and the Greek word uh, equivalent to that is Jesus. Joshua is a picture of the Lord Jesus right there. The Ten Commandments can't take you into the place of rest, but Jehoshua can, the God-man. Um, anyway, it's fascinating, the Old Testament stuff. Um, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness, the sin of unbelief, they rejected God. Verse 18, and to whom swear he, he maybe God swears makes a, an oath against somebody. Wow, that's serious stuff. That they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believe not. So he's getting this across. Look at, they're not entering in because they aren't believing. They're not believing with their heart. Again, go read it. Romans 10, verses 9 and 10, down to 13 there. It talks about the heart. For man believes with the heart. Salvation is through belief with the heart. You can believe in your head. I believe some things about Jesus. I believe this or that or whatever. But it's from your heart that He's your Savior. You have the sins. He did that for you. All that the Bible says about Christ except He's God manifest in the flesh for your sins. Believe in Jesus Christ with all your heart. As many as received Him, to them gave He power to become the sons of God. And he asked the question, verse 18, And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest? Well, it was to them that believed not. To the Old Testament picture of uh, um, knowledge, but with unbelief. The rejection of God brings damnation. So we see, verse 19, that they could not enter in because of unbelief. He's saying to these Hebrews back then in the first century, so you see then, if you have a heart of unbelief, you won't get in. Even though you've tasted, you see, uh, uh, you've seen the things of God, you've tasted of the Holy Spirit working and such, and you understand that's not salvation, belief is. So we, we can also see, well, we see that those, they could not enter in because of unbelief, so the opposite is true. We can see that the door to salvation is only through belief in Jesus Christ. Now, these ones were in danger, they were right at the door, right there. They're hovering before the door and hesitating to go in by faith. And I wondered this, I wondered this. You take your pen, your pencil, mark down Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 to 29, where Jesus says in that day, that's a judgment day, and some will say that they've done this and that and the other thing for the Lord, many wonderful things. And he says, I never knew you. Well, they thought they were just fine. How come? Well, maybe they just had the knowledge. Maybe they were just enlightened. They've never come to that place of belief in Jesus Christ with their heart. You check it out. That's so. Anyways, there's chapter 3. He's going on and continuing on the comparison, trying to convince these ones, look at, here's a great problem and danger before you. Look to the Lord Jesus Christ, salvation in Him only. John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man, that's no one, comes unto the Father but through me, he said. Not in prayer, not in salvation, not any way. He is the door to heaven. You've got to go through the door by faith, by belief from the heart. Anyway, thanks for your time. We'll uh, be back next week, Lord willing, with uh, 
with another one, okay? Take care. Lord bless you. Bye now.